welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Here's what I want to do. I want to go straight into the Word of God. I, I believe God has something for us and has already been working in my own heart. Um, and so I'm grateful to our, our senior pastor staff and Pastor Dan, Pastor Luke, that allowed me to allowed me to preach here from time to time in English. Like I always say, I have to preface it by saying, if I say something wrong, English is not my first language, okay? So just be uh, merciful with me there. Um, but I'll do my best as I try this. If not, you come to La Roca in Spanish, and then you'll see what I'm talking about. But uh, <laughs> let's pray. Would you stand? Let's go before the Lord. You're going to be sitting for a while. So <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Father God, humbly, I We come together tonight, Lord God. We want to hear from you. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher of the church. Come and teach us, guide us, direct us, motivate us, Lord. Come and speak to our hearts. See, the word, the seed is never the problem, Lord. It's the ground. It's our hearts. So we prepare our hearts this hour to be good ground so that when the seed gets in, it will produce much, much fruit. Hundredfold, Father. We ask for that tonight. A hundredfold return on what we hear from your word this very hour. Lord, just as you bless us in this church here at The Rock, we ask that you would bless many churches in the inland empire and around the world or we're not better than them we're co-laborers together with them advancing one kingdom and that's yours alone your kingdom that's all we do father so bless them encourage them today encourage those pastors to preach the true word of god from their pulpits in their area of influence or god so we can advance the kingdom of god on the earth in such a neat uh, time of need as we are in today lord god that you would strengthen them and strengthen the church worldwide in jesus name we ask and we say Amen. Amen. amen have a seat Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Listen, uh, when you hear the title of the message, the, own, um, the title of the message that God has given me tonight is called The, Va- the Value of Tenderness. The Value of Tenderness. So, um, you know, for many people who say, well, it sounds kind of weird. Maybe it's a girlfriend's this morning. It's not, okay? <laughs> it is for everybody, okay? The Value of Tenderness, okay? Uh, it is very important that all of us keep a certain area of our life and on our heart in tenderness. And I've noticed that in, the, in cynical times as we live today, it's really easy for us to lose that aspect and that understanding of what God wants us to do and have and, and, and just be part of our lives. And so I, I want to talk about that because God has he's been working in my own heart in this area. And so when I worked the message, I, I was telling my wife, this message is kind of weird because it's like flying a plane, we're going to take off, and it's going to be kind of rough, but I'll land the bird at the end of the message, okay? So just go with me as we look at some um, verses of the Bible. But the way it came to me is so interesting. I was watching some comments on Facebook, you know, after the debate and all that stuff, and nobody here, you know, friends from everywhere were commenting, and I'm just reading some of this stuff, and I just realized that, you know, many times politics, life, just, we just get cynical. You know, people just write stuff, say stuff, and, and it just comes out. And I'm starting to realize that as a pastor, when I talk to people, I'm learning more and more that a lot of people walk away from God because they've allowed their hearts to become cynical towards God. They've lost the tenderness to be with God and to hear from God. And you can be rough, tough, macho exteriors, whatever you want to call it, but your heart should always lead and have a space for tenderness for the Lord, for God to work in you and lead you and direct you. Otherwise, there is no communication. There's really no way for God to to speak to your life, to direct you in any way, because there is no tenderness in your life. You just, you become hard inside of you, and it's very important that you keep that area of our life protected. And I want to talk about that. I want us to look at this area of our life because everything happens today. There's unemployment. There's death that are weird. There's things that are happening. How do you cope with the things of life? All those things eventually kind of build up in your heart. Are you with me? Let's look at a story, and then I'll connect it. Let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 5. In 1 Kings chapter 5, basically David passed away. Now his son has become the king. Um, and, uh, and so his son is here. Solomon is this, um, the one that's reigning right now, and he's going to build the temple. And it's a very interesting letter that he sends to another king. And he's sending this letter to the king, so the king sends him material so he can build the house of God, the temple of God. And starting in verse 3 of 1 Kings 5 says, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of wars which were fought against him on every side. 
until the Lord put his foes under the sole, under the soles of his feet. So he's saying, listen, my father was always at war with people. And we already know that. And God gave it to him as a, as a word because of what he had committed. Said there will always be, you know, bloodshed and wars next to you. And so it's, it's a prophecy that came true in David's life. So what's going on is Solomon's saying, hey, listen, that's not my case. My father passed away. So God has given me the privilege to now build a temple. Listen to the next verse. It says, but now... The Lord, my God, has given me rest on every side. Man, that is a wonderful statement. And that would be good for all of us. But that's not necessarily true in all of us. Now listen to this. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrences or evil occurrence. And behold, verse 5, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord, my God. So, and then it goes on. But the one word that drew me close, because it was such a weird phrase to me, in verse number four, if we can put it up here in the overhead for you guys, verse number four, he comes and say, there's neither adversary nor evil occurrence. That word in the original language was the Old Testament was written, it says evil thoughts, evil intentions, things that come to people that are evil. And I thought, man, that's so interesting. There's really nothing evil. And he says, I purpose to build the temple. Listen, I talk to a lot of people all the time that want to build, and I'll explain that later, the house of God, meaning the temple, who we are. But because there's so much evil around them, they are unable to build a steady house. Are you with me? You are unable to build your house on steady ground in order to do what God is asking you to do. Go with me to chapter 6, right there in 1 Kings. Verse 11 says this, Then the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this temple, which you are building, if you walk in my statues, execute my judgment, keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you, which I spoke to your father David. So God says, hey, you're, you're building a wonderful building. Man, that's absolutely gorgeous. You have top of the line material, gold, silver, uh, di- I mean, you name it, he had it. You name it, he had asked for it. He was building it big, large magnificent because it was for God and they were wanting to honor God. But God says, hey, um, that temple you're building, unless you do what I'm asking you to do and stay in my ways, I want no part in it. And it's so interesting that a lot of us sometimes don't understand that as we are the temple of God, that we have to also, and we need the presence of God in our life in order to keep on going and doing and walking and believing what God has asked us to believe. Are you with me? And it's so crucial. Verse number 13 says, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. God says, I want you to build this temple, but concerning to the temple, I need you to follow my statutes. I need you to stay connected with me. I need you to keep going so that I keep my word to what you're saying. Are you with me? And that's very important because a lot of times we want God to keep his word, even though God always maintains his words. But he's saying, I'm going to keep my word, but my word will manifest unless you do what I'm asking you to do. Are you with me? It's going to be very hard for the word of God to manifest in your life unless you do it according to what God is asking you to do. It's not going to manifest according to your ideas, to your style, to what you decide to do. It's just not going to happen. It has to come by way of God. Let's forward many, many thousands of years to Matthew 21. Very famous scripture. You guys all know it. Jesus is coming out of doing a triumph, and according to the, um, the way Matthew tells it, Matthew 21, he's coming out of a triumphant walk into Jerusalem prior to his death. He's walking in. He's riding a, a, a donkey. And so everything, people are going crazy. Hosanna and putting their clothes. I mean, it's just an amazing, majestic, majestic moment. If you go there, Matthew 21. Then what happens is Jesus, it says, then Jesus. If you go to verse number 12, he gets off the, the, the donkey, I'm, amazing, I'm, I'm assuming, and all the people are still worshiping. He says, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold uh, doves. Verse 13, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Verse 14, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Verse 15, but when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. How odd. Said they saw the wonderful things God was doing, yet they were indignant. 
Verse 16, and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said, yes. Have you never heard? Oh, have you never read out of the mouth of eight and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. And that's in the Psalms. Verse 17, then he left them and went out to the city of Bethany and he lodged there. So what does all had to do with how I started? Told you we're still flying the plane, okay? How to stay tender, how to stay tender with God and with men. How do I stay tender? That's the question I want us to look at because the cleansing of the temple gives us the right idea for us to understand that. How do I stay tender towards God and others? How do I maintain that area of my life in a way that I'm still receiving? I'm still getting something from God. I'm still um, wanting something that is tender in my life. Number one is know what you represent. Know what you represent know what you represent. It is really hard to stay tender unless you have an understanding of what you represent. I remember many years ago um, when I was in college, we had to uh, do rotations in several hospitals as I was learning some stuff of the medical field in this. And I remember I went to this hospital and, um, and my job was to be in the emergency room and these things that were happening. And there's many Please, doctors, police, you guys have a tough, tough job, so don't take this negative, ne in a negative way. But I was talking to this nurse, right, and this patient comes in. This guy's beat up. We're having a long, long shift. I mean, it's probably 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Everybody's exhausted. This guy comes in, and it's all beat up, and so she tells me, hey, you want to sew them up? I said, sure. You know, I was just a student. Just do what I say. But she went and talked to this guy in such a callous way, like, you're bothered to me. Like, I, I wanted to take a nap, and then you get hurt? Come on, man, what are you thinking? You know, kind of deal? And I was like, what is wrong with this person? And then I was talking to one of the doctors, and he told me something to him. He says, you know, we see it so often. People get hurt. People walk in here. The only way to survive in here is sort of to kind of put a barrier of emotions between the patient and you. And I thought to myself, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you see a lot of hard stuff, so you kind of have to create that. The interesting thing is that in God, he doesn't do that to us. He doesn't put a hard barrier between your mess and his goodness. He doesn't say, man, my hands are too clean. You're a mess. I'm going to go ahead and kind of deal with you with, you know, with gloves on. He doesn't do that. He got into the mess. He pulled you out. He's trying to clean you up, get you to the right place. And so... When we have that understanding, when we have that understanding, when we know who we represent, it changes our behavior. See, if that nurse knew that she represents the hospital and the doctor's in charge and the doctors know that that's how she treats patients, they would say, hey, don't do that because you're a reflection of who I am. And you and I are a reflection of God. And God is tender harder to towards us. Are you with me? Yeah. Matthew 21, 12 to 13, we read it. I'm just going to emphasize it a little. It says, then Jesus went into the temple of God. And drove out and drove out. Jesus came in and just said, you know what? Forget it. I'm going to get the filth. We're going to get all this thing out. We're going to work it out. All those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and, and the seats of those who sold dove. And Pastor Jim has explained this to us before, but I'll remind you. Basically what's going on is people came from far and wide to give their offering up to the Lord here in the temple. But if you travel, let's say, on a horse or a donkey, sometimes, you know, on a camel from Las Vegas or from Miami, you know, all the way across the U.S., all the way here to California, assuming Jerusalem was here. Um, and so when you do that, you don't want to carry a goat for 3,000 miles. Are you with me? So they were like, when I, we show up over there, we save some money, we buy it. Because people knew that. They were at the temple saying, hey, these guys are coming from far away. They're going to have to pay what I'm asking in order to go honor God. Imagine that. Imagine that. People were putting a price on honoring God. That's crazy. But that's what's going on. So Jesus said, this is not, this is not God. This does not represent my father. So he let him have it. And, and it's one of the few times where you see Jesus really... Just go off all the way. Forget you. You know, beating everybody and just, uh, you know, like they say today, went gangster on them. You know, just <laughs> forget you guys. Verse 13, he explains why. He says, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. In, in Isaiah, where this verse is, says, for all nations. For all nations. A house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of thieves. 
See, these people didn't understand. They were portraying a misrepresentation of God and, and what God is and what God is supposed to do. And what, lot, what happens is when you and I look at misrepresentations of God and misrepresentations of reality, we become callous. See, for every pastor that ran with his secretary or took money from church, there's hundreds if not thousands that haven't done that. For many, listen to me, for many people who uh, abuse their children, just thousands if not millions that haven't done that. And so for cops that have done the wrong things, there's millions of others that haven't done that. But we take the wrong thing and we make our heart be callous. And we cannot do that. We cannot look at a misrepresentation of God and of the reality and say, I think that's God. We have to know who we represent. And we cannot allow, allow our hearts to not be tender to God because someone else did the wrong thing. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You cannot permit that in your own heart. You cannot look at the wrong thing and say, well, I'm walking away from Christianity. And many people do that. Look, if that guy did, then they all did. If that was the case, that's crazy. We have to assume that everybody's crazy. We have to assume that everybody's something else. You know what I'm saying? We cannot allow misrepresentation to drive our hearts. The Apostle Paul explains it very clear in 1 Corinthians 3. He mentions this phrase many times in the Word of God. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. Um, so if you, don't have, if you don't have it with you, 1 Corinthians 3, I'll read it from you from the overhead. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says, Don't you realize that all you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you, saying we are the temple of God. That's who we are. The Spirit of God is in us. Remember what Solomon, what God told Solomon, said, you're building a beautiful temple, but I won't be in it unless you follow my ways. Now, Paul is saying, hey, you're the temple of God, and the Spirit of God is in you. So unless you follow my ways, heed to my commandments, then, then, if you do that, then I will be there with you. His presence is always with us. He promised it. But that doesn't mean he's agreeable with us at all times. Are you with me? So he continues saying, verse 17, God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy. Say this phrase with me. And you are that temple. Can we do that? One, two, three. And you are that temple. Oh, say like you believe it. One, two, three. And you are that temple. That's who you are. That's who you are. So you have to know who you represent. And who you represent is God. And if we allow our hearts to become callous, then we no longer give a clear representation of who God is. Are you with me? And so keep a heart tender in what you represent. Verse 18 said, stop deceiving yourself. I love that. Stop deceiving yourself. Stop thinking you're something else that you're not. If you think you are wise by world standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. You need to become a fool to be truly wise. God is saying, if you think you're smart, if you think you're all that, if you have the edge on what's going on, if you want to know God, get dumber. Literally. Like, get it out of your head. You have to understand what you represent. What's the condition of your heart? I was reading an article on this guy that uh, jumped from the sky. Did you guys see that? Felix, what's his name? Baumgartner. Baumgartner. For, poor guy. Well, Felix. So, so Felix jumped from, uh, from, if you haven't seen it, it's amazing, this first human to break the sound barrier. This guy went all the way up. And so they're doing an interview once he lands, right? And he said a phrase that was so amazing. I saw somebody repeat it on one of the social media uh, websites. He said, sometimes you have to go really high to know how small you are. I thought, whoa, here's a guy who saw the world from a point of view that you and I probably will never get to see. And he thought to himself, man, I'm really small. <laughs> Even though he's famous, he's all that here, God created that for you and I and placed us here and gave us authority. And sometimes we have to look from the perspective of God and say, ooh, I am really tiny in comparison to his greatness. And God is saying, you represent me. You represent me. And unless you know who you represent, you're going to do, you're going to misrepresent God and your heart will become callous and you lose tenderness. God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that. The second thing I noticed while reading this story, how to stay tender towards God and others. Number one, how to stay tender toward God and others is you have to know uh, what you represent. Number two, know what you know. Sounds funny, I know, but know what you know, okay? Um, 
Fred, our administrator, always says, you don't know what you don't know. Is that right, Fred? Is that how we say it? <laughs> so you don't know what you don't know, and that's the reality. Know what you know. There's a story in the Bible that's so interesting because that's exactly what we have to do. We have to know the information that's in us. Have you ever? Don't act over spiritual, right? It'll rain on you just on your chair, okay? <laughs> have you ever overreacted to something and then realized that the information you had was wrong? <laughs> Embarrassing, right? <laughs> Exactly. And so you have to know what you know before you do something. Because if you don't, then you start to lose tenderness because you're reacting on misinformation. And so here's how, how Jesus puts it. Matthew 21, 13. We read it. I'll read it for you guys. It says, And he said to them, it is written. So Jesus is saying, you have to know this. You have to know that what you're doing is wrong because it's on paper. We know it. It is written. Okay. My house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. Prayer. He's saying you guys are misrepresenting because you don't know. So you have to know what you know. You have to have accurate information operating your life in order for you not to lose what God is wanting you to have. Are you with me? Yes. Two guys, they have a final exam. And they fall asleep the night before. So they wake up, and the exam is already on wheels. I mean, it's happening. They're like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So one guy says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to show up late, and we'll tell the teacher that we got a flat tire on the way to the exam. Cool. Show up. Teacher, oh, my goodness, so sorry. We missed the final. This is horrible. Um, you know, we got a flat tire on the way to the test. He just says, all right, here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow, come back at 5 p.m., meet me in my office. We'll retake the test. Man, they walk out. I was like, yes, it works, man. He totally, I mean, he was all over that. And so the guys show up at 5 the next day. They studied up. They don't fall asleep. They show up at 5 at the office. The teacher says, I want you in my office. And takes the other guy and says, I want you in my friend's office. So they're taking the exam separate. Man, they're going out and doing great. Flip the page to the second page. Only one question. Like, yes. So the guy looks down and reads and says, for half of the value of your exam, please tell me which tire was flat. <laughs> See, because you got to know what you got to know. They had to know that that was coming. They had to know that. Luke eleven thirty four. 34. Luke eleven thirty four. 34. <clears throat> Jesus talking about it and says, hey, listen, nobody lights up a light and hides it under a basket per se. Nobody does that. And then he goes on to explaining something so interesting. Luke 11, 34, 35 says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. So he's saying what you see, the things that you let allow to come into your life, those things determine what is the content of your soul, what's inside of you, what's going on. They're light for you, okay? Now he does a play on words that was very interesting and he has vexed me for a long time until I decided to study in depth. So verse 35 says, therefore, take heed. We already know the word therefore. Pastor Jimmy started that. Therefore is there for a reason. Because I told you that nobody hides the light. And because I told you that your eyes are the light of your body and what's inside of you. Therefore, take heed. Meaning, therefore, pay attention. You with me? Pay attention. The word is telling us to pay attention. He goes, that the light which is in you is not darkness. Sounds profound. I was confused for many years. Because light is never darkness. Light is never darkness. See, Jesus uses two separate words in the original language to describe light. One word tells us about light as the moon, a different light. The other word is talking about the information that we have, the light that is in us. He's saying, listen, take heed that the light, the information that you've assumed, that you've accumulated, that you've allowed to come into you is actually not the wrong thing. It's actually not darkness. That the light that is in you is actually not darkness. The word says that that word is a lamp unto my feet. I am allowing the word of God to work into my life. That those things that I've accumulated in my heart are not actually the wrong thing. Are you with me? That I don't find myself saying, okay, I've, I've done everything right, but I don't know which tire is flat. Because in reality, my information is wrong. 
I need to know what's inside of me in order to maintain a tender heart. To maintain a tender heart. I need to know who God really is. See, the closer I get to God, and we'll talk about that a little bit, it grows in me. So important. I love the Message Bible. And I wanted to read this verse in the Message Bible. It says like this, Luke 11. I'll start halfway through. It says, if you live, let me see if the guys have it for you there. If you live wide-eyed in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. It says if you live in that life where everything's wonderful and you're looking at it from God's point of view, your body full of light. If you live a squinty eye in greed and distrust, in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. Saying, listen, if that's what you are, man, you're a humid pit on the ground. You're, you're something that has gone bad. They're not used very often here in America, but in Latin America and many countries, because we don't have running water constantly as they do here in the States in many countries, we build cisterns. So we dig a hole, fill it up with cement, or put a tank, and collect water there and reuse it because water comes maybe once or twice a week, and so you fill up your tank, and then you bathe, you do everything from the water into your house, okay? What happens many times is if there's not enough water, there's some water that's going to sit there eventually, and it's going to go bad. And it's because it's in darkness, it's in close, it's humid. Imagine in the tropics, it's hot and humid all at the same time. It stinks. So when I hear that, I know exactly what they're talking about, <laughs> okay? And so it's saying, if you allow that in your life, if you live your life from a point of view where, oh, I don't trust you, I want to see you, I want to see this. As Jesus says, be wise as serpent, but gentle as dove. Jesus is saying, don't be a dummy. But don't do it from a heart that's guile, that, that, you know, that you just want to do harm, that you don't have a tenderness towards God. God wants a tenderness. I'll keep going. It says, your body is a dank cellar. Keep your eyes wide open. Would you read just that phrase with me? One, two, three. Keep your eyes wide open. Keep your eyes open. Your lamp burning so you don't get musty, murky. Keep your life as well lit as your best lighted room. And that's the importance. When you know what you know, when you have the correct information, there'll be light in your heart. Don't judge things by what you don't know. I had a conversation with a friend the other day. That friend calls me up and said, Pastor, I am really concerned. This has been bothering me all week. Something happened at church, and I'm really bothered by it. And, and I want to know because, you know, my kids are asking me. And so, he, I mean, this person was upset. And I said, well, tell me what happened. He describes to me the situation. And I said, well, let me tell you, right away, you're upset about something you're seeing from the wrong point of view. Your information is wrong. Now, everything around it was right. The event did happen, but the way we evaluated the situation was so wrong, he had gotten himself in a dank cellar. He was just musty. He was frustrated. Don't let your life be like that because you've collected the wrong information in your life. Are you with me? How to stay tender towards God. This is the last one for tonight. We've seen two things today. Number one, know who you represent or what you represent. Know what you know, have the right information. Number three and last one for tonight, know your God. Amen. Just know your God. Amen. See, the more you know God and are closer to him, the tender you will be. That's just the reality. I mean, there's not a lot of explaining to do on that one. The reality is that you and I need to get closer to God in order to remain tender towards God. Good. Good. Guys, don't, don't ignore tenderness in your life. See, tenderness, it's what allows you to hear from God. If you're hard-hearted, you cannot hear from God. You cannot hear from your own wife or your kids. If you're hard to your kids and your wife, there's no tenderness in your treatment and what you do. Or wives to your husband, there's no way for anybody to receive anything. You've already made the judgment. You've already said this is what it is. And your heart is already callous to receiving anything or giving anything out. Are you with me? But when you know God, there's a softening of your heart. There has to be a softening of your heart. If somebody is way too hard, they're not allowing God to work in their life. And see, Jesus explains this in a beautiful, beautiful way. I love how this story says it. If you had marked your Bible, Matthew 21. If not, I'll read it for you. Verse 14, he comes and says, verse 14 says, Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he what? He healed them. So here's people that couldn't go into the temple because they didn't have enough of this. 
And Jesus says, forget all of you. You guys do not represent my father. Kicks everybody out and says, now come in and receive what you need. Get to know your God. I want to heal you, restore you, change you, transform you. That is exactly what he does. But you have to know your God and you have to keep a tender heart. But when the chiefs, priests, and scribes, people who did not have a tender heart towards God, even though they were doing everything in the book. You got that? They did everything in the book, but they didn't have a heart for God. So the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And then Jesus said, did you hear? Oh, they were saying, did you hear what these, what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babe and nursing infants? You have perfected the praise. What was Jesus saying? Listen, it takes simplicity. It takes a tender heart to just absolutely worship God and be in the presence of God. I love worship. I love worship. When, uh, especially in Spanish, my first language touches me deeply, but there's hardly a Sunday when I don't weep in our Spanish service. I mean, it's just because there's a tenderness. Because of that, God is saying, if you keep a heart tender, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to reach into you. I'm going to speak to you. It doesn't matter your exterior. It doesn't matter if you're big, burly kind of guy. Who cares? Nobody's looking at what you look on the outside. God is interested in your heart, the transformation, the tenderness. He wants Wants to speak to your situation and unless you change what's in it there is no coming from him he may be talking god i want to hear from you but if your heart is just going to bounce right off are you with me here's what happens and i'll end with this story david which is a man tougher than any of us in here i mean this guy was just absolutely violent and then he would sing a song right after are you with me he was just the head will be rolling down he grabs his guitars and writes a song this guy was crazy. <laughs> but David was awesome because he represents toughness and tenderness. He represents a guy who would do whatever God would ask him to do because he was absolutely in love with God. That's what Psalms it. They're just sons of love and what he was in his heart. I mean, this guy's venting to the Lord and saying, Lord, you're wonderful. You're amazing. And then he picks up a big old sore and goes out to fight. 10,000 people die that day. And you get what I'm saying? So David is the perfect representation of tenderness of heart, yet still doing what you have to do in every way for God. So important for us. 2 Samuel 6 tells us this amazing story. You're familiar with it. I'll just repeat it. 2 Samuel 6, basically he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant back um, to Israel. It's been in the house of a guy named Obed-Edom, and this guy's being blessed because the presence of God is there. I mean, blessed out of his socks. So David said, hey, we got to go get that and bring it back to our camp. I mean, it's got to be here in Israel. But one person died, so David was like, um, let me think this through. So finally, they get everybody. They load up on um, the shoulders of the people that serve the temple, and they're bringing it in. And David is so excited, so excited that God is coming, that the presence of God. Listen, you and I take it for granted because the Bible says that you and I carry the presence of God in our hearts. In the times of David, it was physical. It was represented in the Ark of the Covenant. So David was like, the presence of God is coming to my town, to my house with his people where it belongs. Are you with me? So he's absolutely excited. So every 10 steps, I don't know how it is, he would kill, he would sacrifice something. I mean, he was absolutely just going crazy. He's dancing so hard. The Bible says he took his clothes off. And, and so he's, I'm assuming he had underwear, but he took, you know, his robe, his kingly robe, okay? So he, had, he took his kingly robe, and he was going crazy, and he's just worshiping God. His wife, which is the daughter of the previous king, doesn't like it. She doesn't like it a bit because... She had seen her father represent God in the wrong way. Yeah. See, and the information she knew, the light she had consumed was actually darkness. 2 Samuel 6, 21 says, So David said to Micah, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord. Over Israel, therefore, I will play music before the Lord. David is saying, you don't like it too bad because it was God who picked me to do this. So I'm going to obey God regardless of your opinion. Verse 22, and I will be even more undignified than this, and I will be humble in my own sight. David is saying, forget it. I'm going to do even worse things that make me look foolish just because I want to praise God. Now, let me insert a disclaimer here. 
a lot of times people use this verse to do dumb stuff in church. That's not what the verse means, okay? So let's make that clear. What the verse means is that David was willing to keep his heart in a humble manner, do what he needed to do regardless of how it looked because God has asked him to do it. Are you with me? You and I have to keep that tenderness of heart. What is God asking you to do? Do you know your God in order to keep a tender heart and soft area for him? David did. He says, but as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. David's saying, all these servants that you think are going to look down on me, they're actually going to praise me. They're actually going to see me as a good king. Now listen to the next verse, the sad part. Therefore, Micah, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Bitterness and sarcasm makes you unfruitful. Bitterness and sarcasm makes you unfruitful. And if you want to be fruitful in your walk with God, you're going to have to keep an area of your life tender, and that is your heart. Micah said, I don't want to hear it. I want nothing to do with you. David went on to be the greatest king Israel ever had, far above her father. But she had no children, no one to follow after her, no one to say, you're with me. All because she chose to be bitter and be hard. I don't know where the condition of your heart is, but God is asking you for something. Are you willing to be tender for me? Are you willing to understand there's a value in tenderness and saying, God, I am willing to hear from you. Even though I'm in San Bernardino and this is a tough city. Even though I've lived a tough life, Lord, maybe in poverty for many of you. Maybe a family member did something, whatever it may be. You say, God, I want to change that and actually allow you to be tender. See, because we're taught that unless we're tough, unless we're that, unless we're this, unless I'm hard, you know, unless I have street cred, then it doesn't happen. But you know what? In your search for street cred, like they said now here, you might lose heaven's rewards. And that would be a bad thing. That would be a bad thing. And God is wanting us to let that be shaped in our hearts. Three things today to end that God wants us to do to maintain tenderness. Know who we represent. Know who you represent. Number two, know what you know. Clear the information in your heart and know your God. If you do that, you'll have an area of tenderness in your life activating for God. Amen. I want to make sure that your heart is in the right condition with God. I want to ask, I know some of you guys wanting to leave. We've been in church 55 minutes, so that was extremely fast, so there's really no rush. So I want to ask you to remain seated. Um, because I want to make sure that your heart is in the right place with God. As a matter of fact, if you're sitting there later, we'll, we'll deal with the tenderness of heart. Later on, we'll deal with that. But first, I want to deal with the condition of your soul. And I know lately in church, we've been changing the method of how we do things, but that's okay. That's okay. Those of you who believe that you're born again, saved, go ahead and start praying. Those of you who think, well, pastor, I heard your message and... Um, I understand, but I thought I was tender. As a matter of fact, Pastor, I know in my heart that I feel I know God. I know God. See, but we talked about something really important. That is not the information you have in your head, but the condition of your heart. The condition of your heart. That's what changes. That's what's going to transform your life. That's what's going to work in your life. I'm going to ask nobody to leave. Man, if you want to go, give me 10 minutes. I'll let you go. Okay? I'm asking 10 minutes to respect the Holy Spirit. That's all I'm asking. If your heart is so hard that you cannot sit in church, as a matter of fact, leave now. Is that okay? And that way I talk to people who want to be here and talk to God. 55 minutes of your life you gave to God. I'm asking for 10 minutes with kindness. That you pay attention to what God is asking you to do. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to go through the altar call. I'm going to ask you that if you're sitting there right there today, and you don't know if you die today, you go to heaven or hell, that you get down here right now. You know why? Because God has already spoken to you. And if you decide, I'm going to keep my heart hard before God, and I'm going to face God and forget what God says, forget what the preacher said, then you're on your way to hell and not on your way to heaven. You're going the opposite way of what God is asking you to do. And today, with tenderness, God is saying, I am asking you to come to me. I am asking you to come clear the way this very hour. So if you're sitting there, I don't want to embarrass you, but I want to ask you, 
If you're sitting there today and saying, Pastor, that's me. You've described me. The condition of my heart is not right with God. Why don't you come down here and I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you. I've done my part. Now is your part. Now is your part to say, that's me, man. That, that's me. I got to get myself right with God. I'm asking you tonight to do something bold. I've never done this, but I believe God is asking me to do it. That you walk out of your seat and come right here and we'll pray together. You know why? Because there's a lot of people that did not want you to come to Christ. They just didn't want it. But God wants you to do it. If that's the condition of your heart, get down here and let's pray together. The condition of your heart is you're not sure. What's my relationship with God today? Get down here today. God wants to speak to you. God wants to change you. Thank you for being bold. Thank you for being bold. This is a tough one. I am asking you to do something I've never asked anybody, but I'm asking you to do it because God is absolutely working in your life this hour. Thank you so much. If that's the condition of your heart, you keep coming down here right now and clear your heart with God and say, Lord, I have not walked in tenderness towards you. I'm so far from you. I am in need of what you have for me this hour. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being brave. There's a lot. There's many of you out there. And so I'm going to wait a little more. I am asking you today. There's a move of God in your heart. And people wanted to stop that move of God for you. Now you have to get up and fight for what God has for you. So get down here and let's pray together. Get down here and say, God, I am in need of you. Thank you so much. Just give us a second. We'll pray in a minute. If that's your case, I want you to come down. There's five more of you, and you need to get down here. Not the SPTs, but there's five more of you sitting out there saying, I need to do this. I need to do this tonight. I need to do this tonight. If that's you, get down here right now. God is interceding for you. The Holy Spirit is trying to reach you right now this very hour. There's some of you. Thank you. There's two more. There's one more. There's one more. As a matter of fact, the Spirit of God just spoke to me. There's three men. Three men. Amen. Three of you sitting out there, and you have to get down here. You know it. God knows it. It's your turn. Simple as that. There's one. There's two more of you. Not as PTs, but you haven't given your heart to the Lord. Those are up for you. Thank you so much. Just give me one more minute, okay? Just give me one more minute. I'm sorry if you're sitting back there and you're uncomfortable. Just be patient with us. I, I just see God. I, I see God in the crowd saying, you got to get this done. You got to get this done. There's two more men. I'm, I'm speaking to the men. God is speaking to you. You're fighting them. You think in your heart, you have no idea what you're missing. You have no idea what you're missing. He's trying to reach you where you're at. But you have to make the decision. These people are the bravest people I've ever known and I've ever seen. They stood in a crowd of people that they didn't know. And they said, I, I am in need of God. There's, I've never seen hearts more tender than this right here. It's just unbelievable. Thank you so much. But if you're standing out there, if you're sitting out there saying, it's my turn. It's your turn. It's your turn. Here's what I'm going to do. Those of you who are here at front, would you stand the rest of you and let's give them a hand. Is that okay? Let's welcome these people into the kingdom. Thank you so much. Listen. Amen. You guys, you guys have done something amazing. You've said, I, I understand the condition of my heart. I'm not done with the two men. If that's you, you got to get down here. You got to get down here. You guys have said, the condition of my heart is not right before the Lord. So now I'm going to make something right. And that's amazing. That's awesome. Here's what I want to do. Normally we have Pastor Dave pray with you. He's right there. But I would like this whole crowd to pray with you because you guys took such a bold statement. You said, forget everybody. I'm going to get up in front of everybody. I'm going to give my heart to the Lord. All of us are going to pray with you. And then Pastor Dave is going to walk you through what this prayer means. What are you going to do? The Bible says, thank you so much. There's one more of you. The Bible says, listen to this, that when you pray in faith, you're going to repeat something. But when you say it with your heart, it'll happen in your life, okay? So let's say it all together with and say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus 
I invite you to my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins, the wrongdoings I've committed against you. This day, I give you my life. Help me live for you from this day and until eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. God is so good. Amen. Hey, listen, here's what we're going to do. Pastor Dave, amazing pastor, he's going to walk you and explain to you what this prayer means, give you some material. He'll walk you through all this. You know what we want to do? We want to help you remain. If you go away, if you walk away, then this prayer sort of doesn't work. I want you to stay. He's going to show you how to do that. We're asking you for one thing. Are you ready? Give us one year. Say, God, I've made a commitment today. I'm going to give you this one year. And in one year, we as a church are making a commitment that we're going to help you grow strong in God so you remain in God. Are you with me? So follow Pastor Dave. He'll give you that, explain that to you, and work with you. Way to go, guys. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Give God a hand. That is so wonderful.